Well, good morning, Eagle Heights. A couple weeks ago, Mother's Day, um, we passed out kids' notes, and our illustrious children's team decided that we needed to have a thing added on there that said, draw the pastor. So uh, I, we picked three of my favorite pictures of them drawing me, and here are the top three winners of that. So um, I think they were either trying to give me hair or uh, they were drawing my microphone. Either way, I think it's very effeminate, and I don't think I'd be a very pretty woman. I'm just going to be honest with you. I think I'd make a very ugly one. This one, yeah, I like this one too. This one was one of my favorites. They, the, the, the staff named this the Simpson Brad. Uh, if I were a Simpsons character, this is what I would look like. And this is my favorite one that's the last one. Have no idea what's going on with that. Um, I wish I had a sword and a cape. I don't. Uh, but I'm just going to say that I can't tell if I am a beaver or a woodchuck, but I got some serious teeth going on. Uh, I don't think I need the sword with teeth that big. I think the teeth could do the job, but our kids did an amazing job. Now, this was, thank you guys, the kids did great, but I got to read this to you. This was, uh, on the notes, it says, what I learned. And this is a paragraph, but they got it because we were talking about one of the churches. Uh, it says, once upon a time, there lived a little church, this is Philadelphia, between a gas station and a nail salon. I think that was a metaphor, spelled M-E-D-A-F-O-R-E, they were very poor with only one room. They lived in a sinful town by a volcano, which caused earthquakes somehow. I don't know. I think I failed science. Anyway, so the brave community of people stayed steady while the rest of the town shook, not by an earthquake. That was just a metaphor. Yep, you heard it. That little church stayed strong through it all. Stay strong because God will provide. This story proves it. And I'm thinking, guess what? A kid got that, wrote it down, and I couldn't have said it better, but I'm so thankful for our kids and them being in here and, and making us laugh. We're actually not going to be in Revelation 3, guys. That is my mistake. That came from an old sermon, and I want to apologize to our, our tech staff. I caught it this morning, but the slides have already been built. That's on me. So uh, when you look at that, we're going to be in various scriptures today, and we're going to look at a lot of different things. And the reason being is we're going to be talking about overcoming. We all love stories about people who've overcome. Uh, and and since, it's, since it's kind of, um, since it is Memorial Day weekend, this last week I was, we we're rebuilding a garage and my son, who's a contractor, was helping me and teaching me a lot of things. But he listens to podcasts. He was a Marine and he was listening to podcasts about soldiers and military men who overcame. And we were listening to one about a Green Beret from Vietnam who oh, it was a Sunday, he was at church, and as he's walking out of chapel, he hears that part of his team is pinned down behind enemy lines, and they can't get anybody to him, and he just runs to a chopper, convinces the pilot to take him there. Uh, and as he's taking off and he gets over the drop side, he realizes he doesn't have a weapon, all he's got is a knife. That's all the man has. Okay, Chris, I have scratched myself and I am bleeding. I told you it's going to be an exciting day when Sleepy Brad preaches. I'm already bleeding. Can you get me a Kleenex here? Because it's going to look fun. Does anybody, can somebody render first aid to the pastor real quick? Thank you so much. So anyway, this soldier uh, was rescued by a lady with a Kleenex. No, I'm joking. Anyway, um, so he can't, they can't land, so he just jumps out of the helicopter. Uh, he's about... 25 yards, 30 yards above the ground, lands, rolls, and just starts running. His goal is to take away <laughs> enemy guns, I guess. Well, this battle went on between him and he's surrounded and he's constantly moving. But by the end of this rescue, he has rescued 10 of his 12 team. Two had passed. The other 10 were badly wounded. He gets them on the chopper, but when he gets on the chopper, he lays over. And to make this, the story a little shorter, he had been shot multiple times. He'd been stabbed with a bayonet at least five times. Multiple bones were broken, including his jaw. So by the time they landed, they're not getting a heartbeat. They can't get a heartbeat. They think he has passed. So they take him to the morgue, but he's still alive. But he can't say anything. He's, he's so tired. He's so exhausted. Most of his body isn't working. The only thing he can get working is one arm. And the, he can't say anything to the doctor. And his eyes are so swollen he can't blink. So he punches the doctor to get him his attention. Literally punches the doctor. Hits him. They rush him to surgery. He spends a year in recovery and he lived into his 80s. And he got the silver star. 
That's the kind of story we love to hear about people who overcome. People who literally facing challenges overcome situations. Well, believe it or not, that word overcome is important to us because at the end of every letter, Jesus uses it. Now, here's what's unique about it. Throughout these letters, these seven churches, Jesus is talking to the church. He's not talking to the individual until he calls out for overcomers. Before he starts saying overcomers, he has no... Are you getting ready to give me a Band-Aid? Seriously? Do we have some Neosporin? Let's just do the whole thing. Anybody got a compound chest wound thing that I could put on for that? Thanks, Mike. Somebody has one? Where's your boo-boo? Where's my boo-boo? You going to kiss it and make it better? You going to kiss it and make it better, man? You're not? Sweet? Okay. Bennett, do you you really have a chest compression wound thing on you? Seriously? Okay. Welcome to Memorial Day at Eagle Heights Church, guys. All right. Anyway, I forgot. Oh, overcomers. So anyway, Jesus is just, people are bringing band-aids. People are bringing everything up here. This is incredible. I'm sorry, guys. I told you, sleepy Brad, it's a bad day. Anyway, back to the message. Ah. When he gets to the part of overcomers, he doesn't talk to the church anymore. He's talking to you. He's talking to the individual Christian. He's telling us, because remember, this isn't just to them. It's to all believers. When he gets there, he's talking to you, he's talking to me, and he's calling for us to overcome. Now, this church has a lot of things going on internally that they have to overcome, and believe it or not, we face the exact same things. We see a church at the beginning who's lost their first love, how easy it is to do ministry and lose that passionate first love for Jesus Christ. We see a church that is facing persecution. We see a church that is allowing bad theology and actually false doctrine to come in. We see a church that is so tolerant of the culture and the sin that it's actually allowing it into its church and participating in it. We see a church that has a reputation of being alive but the reality is they're dead. We see a church that has loss of their focus. They're seeing that I'm little, but they realize that God is their strength. And we see a church that's lukewarm. We face all of these things, guys, and overcoming is essential. And Jesus Christ stands there and he says to them, I want you to overcome, regardless of what's going on in your culture, which regardless of what's going on in the church, you personally can overcome. Matter of fact, guys, it is the individual believer in these churches that as they overcame, the more of them that overcame, the more it affected the culture of their church. An overcoming church is a church filled with Christians who are overcoming personally. That's what makes a great church is overcoming believers. But the question today is this, are you an overcomer? Because we need to discover what it means to overcome. So let's take that time and do that discovery. First off, we need to know the definition of overcome. It's a simple word. It's Nike in Greek. It's where we get our, the brand name Nike from. That's where it comes from is this word. And it means to prevail. It means to overcome. Or it means specifically to be victorious. That's what it means. That's the whole focus of the word, overcoming, uh, being victorious, to defeat, overcome, win. That's, that's really what it means. But we don't use the word the same way the world does. In the world's version, it is you competing, winning the trophy, and standing on the number one spot on the, on the awards platform. That's not what this is for the believer. Matter of fact, we need to understand the biblical description of overcome. We need to stop and say, what does this actually mean and how does it actually apply to me as a believer? Now understand something, an overcomer is not some elite Christian. This is not someone who's discovered a truth that's given them something that no one else has. The overcomer is not someone who's got some special anointing from God. The overcomer is not someone that is up here and you're here. That doesn't exist. That is not what it is. If that is your thinking, you need to change your thinking immediately. Because this is the best definition uh, or description of an overcomer. It's simply this. It is a believer whose faith in Jesus has given them victory. Did you catch that? The overcomer, the description, is the believer whose faith in Jesus has given them the victory. That's what it is. So let me show you biblically what an overcomer is. It's simply this. 
Jesus Christ is the foundation and the one who provides us the ability to overcome. Matter of fact, in John, in chapter 16, he's talking to his disciples, and here's what he said to them, in me you have peace. In the world you have tribulation. But he said, take courage, I have overcome the world. I've conquered the world. I have defeated this culture. I've defeated this enemy, and I've defeated Satan, sin, and death. I have overcome it. So understand something. The foundation for victory, the foundation for winning, the foundation to overcome has already been established, and it's in Jesus. Guess what that means? It is your birthright, if you're his child, to overcome. Because that's what 1 John continues to tell us. John continues this line of thought, and he's telling us that overcoming or an overcomer is someone who has put their faith in Jesus Christ. It's simply that. That when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you became his child. Remember something. We identify with Jesus. What Jesus has accomplished counts for us. Because I'm his child, he's an overcomer, I'm now able to be an overcomer. Matter of fact, listen to what 1 John said. Verse, chapter 5, verse 4 and 5. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Who is the one that overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So you become an overcomer when you become a believer. It's available to you. It is your birthright. But you need to understand something. It's also part of your spiritual maturity. Matter of fact, you mature into this birthright. Just like some children aren't handed the fortune of the, if a a parent dies and they receive their, their, their inheritance, they have an age that they have to mature to. Well, overcoming is the same way. Because in 1 John chapter 2, verse 12 through 14, John begins to discuss the spiritual levels of maturity. It's basically a framework of how we mature. In chapter 12, he introduces the first level, which is little children, I'm writing to you. Now understand something. That word little children that's used, if you look at both words that are used, he uses it twice. They're two different words. You put them together, it means dependent ones. Ones who can't take care of themselves. That's the definition. So if you're thinking of it this way, a little child is what? It is someone who's a brand new believer. And what characterizes them is this. They cannot feed themselves. They can't take the Word of God and feed themselves yet. They can't take the deep things of God and understand them. They have to be fed. They have to be taught. That's why if you're a new believer in the faith, you desperately need to be here weekly under the teaching of the Word of God. You need to be in small group where you can build friendships that help you apply the Word of God. Hey, if you're a youth, you need to be here Sunday night and Wednesday night. Parents, you need your children here Sunday night, Wednesday night, and and just saturating their mind with the Word of God. Because as children, they need to be fed the Word of God. Their goal is to become young men. That's the next phase. The next phase, young men do something incredible. They have taken the Word of God and they've applied it to their life. We're going to look at this deeper in a minute. And they're able to feed themselves. The last level is fathers. Now, fathers have known Jesus from the beginning is what it says. It simply means this. They have taken the deep things of God. They understand them. They have lived them out. They have experience in them. They know how to walk in them. And what do they do? They feed others. Little children can't need someone to feed them. Young men feed themselves. Fathers feed others. But it is the young men that something incredible is said in verse 14. It says this, you are strong. Now, why are they strong? Listen to why. Because the word of God abides in you. Now, stop right there. It does not say you've abided in the word of God. It's saying you're at a level now where the word of God abides in you. Now, let me say something. The word of God cannot abide in you until you've been abiding in the word of God. They have spent time in God's Word. They have come to the point where they understand it and they're beginning to apply it. And notice what they're they're doing. They're obeying it. See, the key to overcoming is not something difficult. It is that you're coming to the Word of God. The Word of God is leading you. It's equipping you. And when it says to obey, you follow. The Word equips you. The Spirit empowers you. And you say yes. Now notice what happens as a result of that. They've overcome the evil one. That's what it says. Young men 
who are strong in the word and the word abides in them are overcoming the evil one. Now, that kind of leads us to Revelation 12, 11, where we're giving a picture of overcoming the evil one. It's a very important verse in spiritual warfare. It says they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Now, this is why this verse has failed for so many people. A lot of people think, all right, I'm in this temptation. I need to understand. All I've got to do is quote this verse, and the enemy has to run. All I have to say, you know what? Uh, Satan, I bind you. I hear a lot of binding. We don't see any binding in, in the scriptures of binding Satan or binding spirits or calling out demons. That does not exist biblically. That's an invention in the 20th century. But we see what happens is we say, Father, I, you start commanding, saying, by the blood of the Lamb, by the, by the word of my testimony, and I love not my life unto death, you have to leave me alone. Notice what happens. This is not something that you command. These are not words that you say. This is a character that you've developed. You don't overcome by quoting a scripture. You overcome because you're a child of God. Notice what happens. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, which is what? Jesus Christ, the foundation. He's the one who established it. The word of their testimony, which is what? They believed in that sacrifice. They put their faith in him, like 1 John says, and they love not their lives unto death. They've come to the point where Scripture dwells in them so deeply, they will only follow Jesus Christ, and they would rather die than go back. They've burned the ships. Remember that story when they landed, and they said, burn the ships, we're not going home, this is our land now. It's that moment you said, I'd rather die than go back to who I was. See, that's character. That's developed. That's put in you as you mature. It is not something that you say. It's who you are. And it's part of your maturing process. When you've come there, you automatically will have victory over that. Does that mean I won't struggle? Absolutely not. Does that mean I won't fail every now and then? No, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying perfection. I'm saying you're put in a place where the Scripture's empowering you, that sin is no longer controlling you, and you can say no to sin, no to temptation, and you can navigate all the things that this church is facing that we just discussed. See, that's an overcomer. It's part of growing in your faith. God provides it. He is the one who gives it to you through salvation. You mature into it. It becomes who you are and it becomes how you live. That's overcoming. See, that's what it means. But we need to be able to look at something because in every single verse or every single church, God began to promise something. So we need to start discerning who is an overcomer. Now, there's no blanks in this, and I put all the verses in here. That's why there's not a main passage. But we need to understand, because in every single one of these, Jesus is promising something unique to the believer and to the overcomer. Now, notice something. He's not promising this to just anybody. It's the believer who overcomes. Now, guys, you need to understand something. These two things are intertwined, and you'll see why at the end of the message, so don't miss this. Notice the first question we see. This comes out of the church in Ephesus, and it says, what does it mean to eat from the tree of the life of the paradise of God? Notice what the overcomers are promised in the very first church. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the church. It's to the one who is victorious or overcomes, I'll give him the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, we see the tree of life where initially, Garden of Eden, Genesis 3, we see that. Adam and Eve sin, and God has a discussion. You see the Trinity talking, and they said, we must expel them. Why? Because if they eat from this tree, now that they're sinners, they're going to live eternally in a sin body. Their bodies will be eternal and they're trapped in a sin nature. So we have to expel them. They kicked them out of the Garden of Eden. Now we don't see the tree of life again until Revelation. Now where do we see it? We see it in the new heaven, in the new earth, in chapter 21. Now what is that? God has destroyed everything, and he had to destroy the earth and this creation for one reason. Sin had corrupted it. See, you can't renovate sin. It has to be removed. It has to be eradicated. So after destroying it, he creates a new heaven and a new earth. Now here's the incredible thing. It says from his throne flows a river of life. And it flows by the main street in heaven. And on either side of that river, there's trees of life going down. Each one bearing a different fruit for 12, uh, one a month for 12 months. So you're getting 12 different fruits all year long. 
It's showing this incredible picture of God's life. Now, why is that there? For one reason. It says it heals the nations. What was the nations losing? Life. We lost life. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, what entered the world? Death. Man is now dying. And all that sin brings with it comes with it. At the end, what is restored? Life. The nations are healed. But who gets to eat that? Only overcomers eat this tree. Only overcomers eat this tree. But it goes on and says something else. Notice what it says to the next church. It says in the second one, what does it mean to be hurt by the second death? Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who's overcoming or victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. We see the second death in Revelation 20. It's called the great white throne judgment. Now understand what that is. This is not believers. Believers have already been judged. Now we're not judged according to our sin. There, this is a judgment of works. How did we serve? This one is different. Because at the end, initially what this was for was to cast Satan, his angels, sin, death into the lake of fire. But it also said there's going to be people there who haven't believed in Jesus Christ. Now understand what's happening in this moment. The Bible is clear that if you haven't put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're already condemned. What does that mean? It means that you've lived your life saying this to God. God, I don't want you. I don't want your cross. I don't want your forgiveness. I don't want you offer. I'll run my own life. Stand back. I'll take the reins. That's what you're saying to God. So when you come to this moment in the end of time, and the Bible says everyone will be there that's ever been created, it says the graves will open, the a sea will open, and all the dead who have not believed in Christ will stand before him. Everybody. You're going to stand before God, and in that moment, God is going to say one thing to you. You've not desired me at all throughout, my li- out throughout your life. You've constantly rejected my offers, and I respect you for that. In other words, I'm going to let you have your choice. I'm going to let you enter into heaven, into eternity, and guess what you're going to get? You're going to spend eternity without me. Now, that sounds good to a lot of people, but you don't understand what that means. It means everything of God's grace that you're experiencing, love, grace, life, everything that he provides to every single person, all of it is gone. You are isolated and you are alone and you're separated from everything and you get to exist in your sin. The worst part of yourself is that part apart from God. And you're going to exist in that for eternity with a bunch of people who exist in a selfish sin state that want nothing to do with God, and they're constantly, the Bible says, gnashing their teeth, which means what? The regret is so deep that you're physically expressing in your body. Do you know what the worst part of hell is? Separated from the Creator who gives life. And in that moment, all unbelievers will be given their choice, and they'll forever cast in the lake of fire. No one of us in this room wants that. I'm pleading with you today, It is the most horrid existence possible. Why would you choose that? Please don't. Jesus Christ has made a way for you to be free of that. And you don't have to pay for your own sin with your own life. But see, overcomers don't touch the second death. What else do the overcomers does he promise? Look at C. What are are the hidden man and white stone promised overcomers? Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who's victorious, I will give the hidden manna. I'll also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it. It's only known to the one who receives it. Now, we know what manna was. It's what God fed the children of Israel in the wilderness. But understand why he gave it to them. Every morning they were to go get it. God was teaching them that one thing. You can trust me. Remember what he said? Man does not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He's teaching his children that even in the most inhospitable environments, God can sustain you. He's teaching us that we live in a culture that does not love us, that is going to hate us, and eventually will persecute us in some form. But we can be sustained in the middle of that. These churches could be sustained, even though many of them were compromising with that culture. We see Jesus himself at at his temptation saying, I will eat when my father says eat, because man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. 
So we know what this manna is. It's God feeding us. It's a lifestyle of dependence. But it's combined with this white stone with our name written on it. Now, there's a lot of debate, but you've got to put the two together to understand what this means. White stones are written as an invitation to a special feast. Now, when you put these two together, notice what's happening. Overcomers are invited to a special feast where you're dining with the Father. You're dining with the Son. You're dining in a place of intimacy where you are the special guest. I picture Psalm 23 where David said, you prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. I see you sitting there on the other side and on the other side of that table is your enemies. It's your past. It's that old sin nature. It's death. It's everything we fight against. It's everything that we want out of our life and out of our world. And you're sitting there with life itself and he is feeding you and the enemy can do nothing about it but watch. Watch. Because now you have overcome, and now they are subject to God, and they cannot touch you another day. You've got a new name, and it has nothing to do with who you were. It has everything to do with who you are. But then it goes on. It doesn't stop. He keeps going. Look what D says. How will overcomers have authority to rule the nations? To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. They'll rule that one, Jesus, will rule with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just I've received authority from my Father. I'll give that to the morning. I will give that one the morning star. Now stop right there. The entire creation is God's inheritance. And notice what he's going to do. He's going to defeat every enemy. He's going to drive out all sin. All the things are gone. Now I want you to stop and think a second. Imagine a city that has no sin. And the effects of it. Think about that a second. Think about a city with no drug problem. Think about a city with no theft and crime. Think about a city with no abuse. Think about a city with no neglect. Think about a city with no addiction. Think about a city where everyone has a home. Think about a city where it's at peace. True peace. That you know your neighbors and your neighbors love you and you love them. You don't have that one neighbor that walks his dog and lets that dog do its business on your yard to the point you want to kill that neighbor. You literally are watching peace. Now why? Well, because God has established it. He is the morning star. He is shining. And Daniel says, We are too, and we're shining in His righteousness. We get to stand and rule over a city that is both righteous and peaceful, and we have no job but to enjoy what Christ has provided. Can you imagine the idea of running a city today? Oh my gosh, that would sicken me. But to watch a city that's ruled by peace and righteousness and see what it does, and we just get to enjoy each other? The overcomers will experience that. But they'll also experience something else. Look at E. Who will not have their name blotted out of the book of life? I've spent a lot of time on this. It's very simple. There's a life, there's a book that was written at the beginning of time, which was the book of life. And everyone created is in it. But those who did not put their faith in Jesus Christ, their names are being blotted out. When those names are done, what's left is the Lamb's book of life. After the judgment we just described, that book becomes the Lamb's book of life because every name that hasn't believed in Jesus is taken out of it. Notice what he's telling you. Your name will never be blotted out. But then we get to F. What does it mean to know Jesus' name? You know what's crazy? We don't know. We don't know. All we know is this. There's a moment where it's just you and Jesus. And he starts revealing himself to you. Things you've never seen. Things you've never known. Things about him that are between you and him. But here's the incredible thing, guys. That's not an event. That's our eternity. Do you realize God is endless? Our universe is expanding at a rapid rate. They've already discovered that. Which disproves a lot of the scientific theories about creation. We're not going into that, though. But it's a reflection of God who is endless himself. We will spend eternity discovering this incredible depths of who Jesus Christ is. And it's going to get sweeter and sweeter and sweeter. Which leads to the final one. What's the final one? Who gets the privilege to be seated on Jesus' throne? To the one who's victorious, I'll give the right to sit with me on my throne. A lot of people argue and debate about what that means. I think the key word is not that we're on a throne. It's the word that's before it. It's the word to sit. 
When Jesus Christ sits, everything is completed. When he goes to heaven and he's seated by his Father, the seat he's earned, redemption is done. We see him in Revelation. Next week, the Father is seated, but he's not rested, he's reigning. But at the end of this, we're seated. We've been seated in a position that Christ gave us, which finally means what? We finally rest. It's over. Eternity is before us. Our past is behind us. And we're receiving what? I'm sitting in a place of honor that I didn't earn. I don't deserve. I couldn't get on my own. But my Jesus who loves me gave it to me. Now this is what overcomers get. But I need you to hear me now. I'm going to ask the question again. Are you an overcomer? Now listen to what I'm saying. Please listen. Only believers are overcomers. And overcomers are believers. Looking at your life, would you describe it as one that's overcoming? Many times when we examine our salvation, here's what we say to ourselves. Well, I prayed a prayer. I need you to hear me. That's great. But that's not evidence of salvation. That's the entry into salvation. That's how we step into that relationship. But there's got to be evidence. If all you have is this prayer way back here, and that's your only evidence, I'm going to challenge you that there's a good, point, a good chance and a good possibility you never knew Christ. Because when Christ steps in your life here, it alters everything from there on. Everything. I am a grandfather now. My grandchildren have altered my life. Last night, I had two of my babies over. Our house was a wreck. We had the Noah Ark's toys everywhere. We were having Nerf battles. We only had one dart, and we were shooting each other and wrestling and chasing down that one dart. We had coloring papers here. We had this everywhere scream, toddler, 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 toddler. I had drool on my shirt. I had sweat. I was, it was crazy. Best time ever. You know how I know I have grandchildren? There's evidence everywhere. Not because someone said, hey, you're a grandfather. Or I didn't come up and said, I believe I'm a grandfather. No, I have evidence of having grandchildren in my life. Do you have evidence of Christ being in your life? We said an overcomer is someone who's feeding on the Word of God. An overcomer is someone who is allowing the Word of God to change them. The overcomer is someone who's saying yes to God. An overcomer is someone who is obeying God, not perfectly, but they're growing into that. Does that describe you? Are you in the Word of God? Is the Word of God beginning to dwell in you? In other words, you're being guided by the Word of God, not your desires. Are you feeding on it and you're coming to the point to realize he's right and you're adjusting to it, not your feelings about it or what you think it says, but exactly how he's saying it. To the point you're overcoming. This is not immediate. It's a growing process. But slowly, slowly, that old sin nature that remains in you is losing its power over you. It's losing its voice. You're no longer listening to it. It is still there, but it is relegated to the back room. And when we go to heaven, Christ is going to cut it off. It's going to be gone forever. Is that you? If it's not, please listen to me. Just because you prayed a prayer doesn't mean you're saved. You know you're saved if there's evidence that that prayer has changed you and you're overcoming. If you're not, if you're not even on that road, because you can be a child still growing, you can be a young man still growing, but if you're not growing, if you're not changing, how in the world can you claim that the God of the universe lives inside of you? Two little kids, three little kids, four little kids, about to be five, changed my world. How can four little, five little humans change your world and the God who created the world not change your life? Be honest. Because my greatest fear is this, and I need you to listen to me, that you're going to be standing there before God someday. 
And He's going to look at you and He's going to say, depart from me. I don't know you. And you're going to look at Him and you're going to list a bunch of religious reasons why you should be there. And He's going to say, go. I don't know you. You know what will break my heart more than anything? That right there that you sat here and you knew the truth, but somehow you were deceived from it. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, please be honest. Are you changing? Are you different? Can you see evidence? I'm not saying perfect, but you're growing. You're moving. You're desiring. There's difference in you. There's maturing in you. If not, then you need to put your faith in Jesus Christ right now. How do I do that? you got to come and admit you're a sinner. That means this. I'm not only a sinner, I deserve the punishment for sin. And if I die right now, I know I'm condemned. I have no hope because I deserve this is who I am. If that's you right now, would you admit that to God and say, God, I'm a sinner? Just what I said, just say, God, I'm a sinner. I admit it. That also means I can't rescue myself. My only hope is through Jesus Christ and His sacrifice on the cross. And I come and I put my faith in Him and nothing else. To say, Jesus, I believe in You. But then you're confessing something. What is that? This isn't I'm just trying to get away from hell. I'm changing my life. I'm realizing this life, the way I'm living it, doesn't work anymore. And Jesus is truly the only answer. So I'm leaving who I was by embracing Him, and I'm asking Him to be my Lord and my Savior. Lord's in charge. Savior's your rescuer. If that's you this morning, say, Jesus, I confess you to be Lord and Savior. Now, if you prayed that with me, would you tell Jesus one, just two little words? Tell Him, thank you, because you just became His child. Father, right now, I know in a room like this, in this size, I know we're down today, it's Memorial Day, it doesn't matter. I know there's people in here who think they're saved and they're not. I know there's people in this room that are truly saved. I know there's people in this room who are questioning and they're on the edge and they're looking at it. And I pray for all three groups. For those who are saved, I pray that you deepen their walk so they come more and more like you. For those who think they're saved, open their eyes. Let them look past the religious action and some prayer they prayed and let, let them answer the question, has that prayer changed me? And for those who are questioning God, who aren't believing yet, I pray, God, that you reveal yourself to be true to them. The gospel will be the answer. And they say yes to you as you bring them to the point of belief. Father, our only goal today is for us to know for sure that we're overcomers. That when we enter into eternity, we know where we stand. Because we stand on the only foundation that can take us there. And that's your sacrifice on the cross and you. Nothing else. Thank you, Father. We love you. In your precious name we pray. And Eagle Heights said, Amen.